this is our fourth talk and we're taking the boat from Harwich to the Hook of Holland <laughs> with uh, Dr. Jan Woutstra, who will show us some different approaches to urban renewal on mainland Europe. So I don't know anybody who doesn't know Jan. He teaches landscape history and theory at the University of Sheffield, trained in landscape design, horticulture and conservation, and has practiced as a landscape architect and historian working on projects as the uh, including the restoration of Chiswick House uh, and the Privy Gardens at Hampton Court. He's been teaching part-time for 35 years and is concerned for the quality of the built environment. I think he provokes and cajoles and makes sure that we're all, uh, the landscape profession is uh, challenged to perceive notions about landscape design and research and to increase knowledge within the profession. He's authored and co-authored and edited many books and most recently, The Politics of Street Trees and in press is Future Histories, Teaching History in Landscape Schools. So Jan, the Zoom stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good. Um, th thank you. Um, that was a very generous uh, introduction. Um, and um, I'd like to go straight into this. Uh, urban renewal. Uh, I've selected two schemes. Um, and I'm going to sort of put these first into context. Um, uh oh. Um, the, there are, um, basically the, the main question is how do we want to live and um, uh, there have always been Arcadian ideals um, I'm just providing you with a little bit of context with, uh, with respect to how uh, of, of, of growth in ideas about um, sort of housing developments uh, from the late 19th century onwards when the Netherlands really started to grow and industry uh, and industrial development really came off. Um, so uh, this is a scheme um, which uh, a plan by an architect and landscape architect, Louis Paul Zogger, uh, one of a, a family of landscape architects for a housing development for workers housing in Achneta Park in Delft. Uh, the the blocks are built like pavilions, and but you can see they are sort of back-to-back uh, -back houses um, uh, at the same time. So um, it is uh, uh, an interesting scheme that uh, continues to be much treasured. Um, that is an ideal. Uh, you noticed sort of the winding path there. And that was in complete contrast to uh, a plan that had just been produced for the extension of uh, Amsterdam uh, in 1866 by uh, Jacobus van Niftrik. Um, the scheme here is the, the big scheme uh, on the right hand side. Um, part of it, which you can see, is extensive blocks, so not continuing the development of Amsterdam as it was with the rings of canals, which you see at the, uh, in, uh, from right from the center, every period added its, uh, but uh, uh, rather more sort of development in, in the style of, uh, of uh, Paris and, um, and Vienna of the 19th century um, with, with axes and, uh, 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 star shapes uh, here uh, as well. The reality, of course, was different because everything was given over to private development. Um, and the, the uh, development was particularly sort of um, disappointing. Um, housing was very dense, uh, high, with very little green space left. Uh, blocks were very uh, close to get, uh, very narrow or didn't have um, green space at all or gardens and this is one of these um, sort of workers housing blocks which was built in that particular period um, and um, uh, has been uh, well has survived has recently been restored uh, to its sort of uh, 19th century appearance 
and gives an idea as to the density. Um, these were all uh, sort of apartment blocks, tenement blocks uh, with, uh, with rooms which were uh, housing whole families. Nowadays, they house um, families of one or two persons. But then at the time, it was with, uh, with lots of kids. So quite lively, um, as it is now, actually, but uh, in a different, very different way um, as uh, more uh, middle class housing. Um, so the question came up again in the early 20th century, where to and how to extend. And uh, Amsterdam site was the next selected project and um, uh, Hendrik Peters Berlage was the person who sort of um, was asked to prepare um, uh, a scheme for South Amsterdam. And his initial thought was uh, very much uh, anti um, sort of the uh, Parisian model with the, uh, the winding roads. And this wasn't actually sort of taken on. And uh, a few years later, he developed another plan for the same area, uh, Plan Zuid, uh, which you see is a, a series of axes, but with smaller and closer uh, uh, streets at the back and this scheme is the one which was executed and uh, with extensive wide avenues and uh, um, uh, tenement blocks or no um, uh, apartment blocks uh, sort of uh, four five um, and uh, six stories high with in, in as a pièce de résistance uh, um, a, a skyscraper in the center of it, um, at, at the center, central axis. Here you can already sort of notice sort of a, a dilemma and uh, uh, sort of debate about uh, modernism and uh, and rather more traditional development, um, which is uh, very interesting in Dutch housing of that particular this particular period. Um, and here you see some of the sort of the more traditional brick structures um, within the uh, the Berlage scheme, very much uh, favoured housing scheme e uh, even today. Um, so that is um, yeah, that was one area. Um, so that was Berlage who became famous. Another important development was the whole sort of issue of. Uh, um, so social housing, which was sort of uh, in executed in this area, which was sort of experimental housing, which was done uh, and set a standard, a new standard, and that included uh, the uh, the Zaanhof um, by Wallenkamp, the architect Wallenkamp, and, um, and this has got a number of sort of. Uh, uh, poems which sort of state the uh, the reason, the rationale for the architecture, which uh, I have provided you with a very bad sort of translation, but it 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 is helpful. It is a literal translation of of uh, of something that is in rhyme, so that never works very well. But at least it gives you the sort of the the meaning of of, of this. The state gave it a weak law. And support, and the weak law was the uh, the, the housing law of 1901. And I'll come back to that in a minute. The city joined to support the care um, with civic sense, stirred by fair complaint, commenced uh, building and served its utility to state, city, and the people. I think so. That this sort of sums up the, the rationale, and there were a couple of others. Um, which explained why it was executed to such high standard. First of all, it is compared to uh, a people, a person's dress. A person's honor, value, and station depends on it, on their dress. A well-built home is the dress of life itself. God's praise for the council's order that enabled the people to go in party dress with joy and grace. And another one, when uh, this being done during the Second 
and and just after uh, sorry the first world war when old Europe encountered its deadliest, deadliest juncture, um, has in, it, in this, uh, the, these darkest times, driven by noble spirit with art and love light, um, has here the patrimony given its sons rest and peace in a friendly home. So that was a sort of, yeah, creating a friendly home uh, uh, relevant to the people's status and, uh, yeah, uh, adequate and also to the to the city's honor and one of the key schemes was het schip um, by the housing association Eigenhaard, which i show you here on the picture which was uh, uh, designed by michael de Klerk. and like all these schemes or most of these schemes they were around a central courtyard uh, which was a communal courtyard and um, yeah that became sort of a standard until the general ex extension plan uh, of Amsterdam, um, with uh, with with uh, by Cor van Eester, the architect, uh, all the red bits are the sort of the next proposals, um, which was referred to as organic development. I'm not going to talk about that today, but just to point you out that there is uh, another history. I'm just going to show you a couple of sort of uh, uh, more slides in, in due course. Um, so the traditional development of Amsterdam as Rotterdam was sort of the rings of uh, development um, with uh, traditionally private housing, but this was the favorite look and uh, habit of, you might say, of the Dutch city. Uh, Rotterdam um, suffered a, a rather bad um, bombing at the beginning of the war which caused the Netherlands to capitulate um, so this is it shown on the 14th of May after the bombing um, and um, which flattened the city uh, which then had to be rebuilt um, with, um, with only the uh, church left um, and um, yesterday it was mentioned the Leinbaan which was in this area uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, um, but um, just to point out that um, there was a whole scale uh, renovation and that went with an enormous debate about the style of the architecture and that included sort of experimental housing like this in Groenendaal in um, Rotterdam which shows you sort of a, a combination between the, the more traditional and the modernist or trying to find new ways of expressing that and it's the same in Amsterdam um, where similar housing was sort of experimented with so um, but the majority of housing um, was suburban housing um, and um, that certainly the majority uh, was sort of in land take um, and it was pretty much of one style. And by the 1960s, there were sort of uh, great criticisms as to uh, the nature of these. They generally had very generous green space, um, uh, but built around the Redburns system um, with, um, with with access pedestrian access to these parks and um, with but with complicated layouts um, which made driving uh, difficult. Um, so that that is that is one type, and uh, often that was associated with some um, uh, high rise housing, which you see here on the right hand side in the background but uh, architects started to complain and one of the uh, the uh, 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 housing schemes that um, that served uh, um, uh, as an example and as an experiment to do something different was um, uh, Rosendahl in Leusden where the architect decided to ignore and try and develop a model, an archetype, a prototype for a housing scheme. Um, in order to do that, he had to ignore 
everything that was there so all the existing the existing ditches uh, existing trees etc so this is a sort of a blank sheet development which is uh, you know uh, a, a crazy development but um, the scheme is worth mentioning and as it was uh, achieved together by the architect with the uh, landscape architect Wim, Wim Boer um, which uh, created these arches of houses uh, interlocked um, which were one third more dense than a traditional uh, suburban housing scheme and uh, tr try to achieve to become more green. There had just been a conference on how to sort of live in woodland and uh, the other aspect that had come up was the artist Louis Leroy, who had promoted a uh, more naturalistic um, uh, schemes in the, uh, with uh, uh, nature in housing developments. And all these were taken on board by Boer and created into a scheme that created uh, 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 smaller units around uh, or encompassed by these uh, arcs with the bigger arcs and then within that uh, with playgrounds and facilities that created these these units of um, of knitted uh, neighborhoods um, this is it as uh, the first part was completed and the great arc which you see here in order to achieve these arcs of houses they had to have a smaller front and a wider back so uh, and the wider back faced onto the sort of the more uh, the, uh, the or the front faced onto where the cars uh, had entrance and the backs uh, onto the the green space uh, basically that is the principle and as you see uh, from the aerial fo photographs um the uh, uh, this has become uh, a success in the sense that it achieved its objectives and there is a strong knitted community there is a um, uh, there's a good website which you can access um, there uh, and there are uh, films which show you how this is uh, co communally managed um, I'm showing you first a couple of uh, aerial shots to show you what it looks like very green uh, and successful um and but it is you know sort of middle class housing um, it is uh, uh, there are rented units but um and there there are also units for sale uh, so these are, are my photographs which are taken a couple of years back um and show sort of the houses the front of the houses with private balconies they're all staggered so that gives maximum privacy on balconies and um, and has given uh, these areas their, their character also um and here uh, the playgrounds at the front um and uh, and at the back the uh, the green uh, network which uh, includes an extensive sort of network of canals um, and it in includes its press de chest pièce de résistance uh, a swimming pool um, which uh, uh, is the center of the community and this is where everyone meets and this is where you know friendships are, are built and um, yeah and this has become a considerable success um the landscape architect was considerably sort of uh well was very proud of this many many uh, with the achievements in the first sort of 20 years of it so uh that is just as a as a prelude so the uh, so we've got uh traditional uh, cities being built uh, and the extensions are primarily on greenfield sites they're outside um they're in in different ways they are um and um 
by the 1950s, as in this country, there was sort of uh, a drive to make old cities accessible to cars. And um, in, in order to do that, there were sort of ideas of putting roads and councils uh, started to buy up houses and demolish them as they came available in order to do that. And that was the case here in Zwolle, where the old city, uh, where a road was planned through the city and housing was demolished as a result. Um, and the city is a beautiful sort of uh, medieval city. It's a Hansa town, which means the Hanseatic uh, um, uh, sort of connection uh, with uh, trade centers of uh, sort of the, the, the late 16th century. Um, and that, uh, uh, so it was a, an important city with imported houses, which, uh, and then in the 1960s, and this is the city wall with the additional houses on the right hand side you can just see part of the wall sticking out above the houses that were built against it and um, and here you see a part of the wall at the end of a shopping street um so uh, yeah uh, and here you see that wall sort of uh, to give you a little bit of context as to what we're dealing with here where the 17th century house they're just at the right hand side so the city uh, has got these uh, sort of early 17th century redoubts, um, which in the 19th century were sort of uh, uh, transformed into parkland. Um, but um, here was the idea of, um, uh, of, of developing this and putting a road right through the, through the city center um, and uh, to demolish uh, housing as a result. We're just going to have a look at what happened here. Um, so this was uh, uh, an idea to actually save that and, uh, and, and actually rebuild the fabric of the city. And it was particularly this road and uh, which, which was in, in question which was not executed in fact but uh, so we're, we're we're in this this part here um where uh, uh Aldo van Eyck was asked to uh, to produce a scheme that would sort of uh, be provide a vision for future uh, development of the, of the city and a revival of the city so up to now as i said uh, the main emphasis had been on greenfield sites on the city's edge. Well, Alder van Eyck, uh, at, by that stage, already made an international name for himself for his children's playgrounds um, and uh, together with his wife, Honey. And, um, and he is one example, which generally contains standard equipment um, uh, made of the fabric of the city and... Uh, and and uh, yeah, and they were placed all over the city, and there were no fences around them, and that was purposely done to create an awareness, to slow down cars, and to to stop sort of uh, uh, dominance of the car. Um, he also um, had become a part of uh, SIAM, the International Congress of Modern Architecture. And um, he was one of the, uh, the the young generation that when Siam wound down, uh, which was in fact chaired by the city architect of Amsterdam, Van Eisteren, um, it, 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 uh, he started tem team, team 10. Um, and that emphasized, started to emphasize the, the social and uh, the relationships uh, between social and built structures. So, and one of the projects that illustrated that was the uh, the orphanage in Amsterdam, which you see here on the right hand side, um, which uh, uh, was explained as 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 a sort of a, uh, a part of a new movement in architecture uh, called structuralism, and structuralism was 
influenced by the anthropologist uh, Claude uh, Levi Strauss, and that, and he had advocated uh, uh, looking at the archetypal behavior of man. Yeah, so the uh, not only sort of the, the the traditional behavior, but also the uh, looking into that as the origin of architecture, which had a great influence on architects at the time. In addition, it was long a parole, uh, the language and speech of the linguist um, Ferdinand de Saussure, um, that enabled individual interpretations or advocated individual interpretations. So the emphasis here was on, on coherence, growth and change, those were the key words, sense of place and urban structuring and articulation. And the two schemes which I'm going to show you sort of try to uh, so to, to be a, an expression of this with principles of structure and infill and aesthetics of number. So those are some of the key sort of terms that were used in order to express this. And Aldo van Eyck was an intellectual. He was a great speaker. He um, was impressive and uh, passionate about architecture and trying to understand that. And he would write articles such as in this international journal, Acoustics. Uh, Aldo van Eyck was born of Dutch parents, but they moved to, the, to England um, and, and he spent his, uh, his, his primary school here and then returned to the Netherlands to, uh, to study architecture, uh, his secondary school and architecture. And he also studied in Switzerland. So he's, with that multicultural uh, background, he was, had a great interest in sort of um, different cultures and that uh, included exploring sort of the, uh, the architecture of the Indians. Um, and uh, yeah, the scheme he, ca he came up with was, first of all, you know, you've got to, impress the um, uh, the politicians and get a, get away. There was a, a the, the large area had been demolished there. I'm going to show you that back in a minute. Um, and um, yeah, uh, here that corner which I pointed out to you earlier. Um, so here is the scheme uh, produced by Aldo van Eyck. So this was all this area was had been demolished. Uh, there had been demolition here as buildings had become available. So all this was ready for redevelopment. Uh, an additional area was here. And uh, uh, Aldo van Eyck had come up with, 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 with a suggestion as to how that might be infilled. Uh, taking traditional materials of the city and sort of uh, providing uh, uh, an uh, infill uh, with that and here you see how that uh, came to be executed very dense uh, and this is the, actually an area that wasn't executed but um, he, he had drawn it and uh, and here you see sort of the the main area that includes these houses and some here and these these blocks as well actually and these you can pick them out um, and this is the scheme as produced. Um, so when I trained as a landscape architect um, uh, there in uh, in the Netherlands, we were taken out here and uh, had Aldo van Eyck to talk. And we were taken in through this, between these two buildings into the area. And you can see uh, the car was uh, allowed in and actually provided for. Um, but the main thing was, you know, it all looked like a pedestrian area. Uh, so uh, around existing buildings, but then also infill of one of the buildings, um, but then coming through and underneath a main block um, with a car park, which isn't underground, but is sort of uh, just about level. Uh, and provides the houses with this with the stage above um, and um, at the back coming out sorry uh, you could this is at the back you come out here with a few steps and you turn around and you face this and you've got a series of uh, houses townhouses 
which are three stories um and um uh, yeah with uh, combined entrances with interesting thresholds uh, emphasized in a previous lecture uh, by louis diaz um and um, and here on the other side as well so these were internal streets that can be accessed by the public um and uh around so the public can have access to all this but um, it is provided for with narrow entrances and in fact one is here um, and up uh, so uh, again a, a series of maisonettes um, and uh, uh, ground floor uh, 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 yeah, maisonettes and then uh, uh, houses on, uh, on top different levels so um here we sort of see sort of how that worked within the arrangement of the buildings. But the main thing about this was that instead of this road in the initial sort of sketch uh, to convince the architects, there was always the idea that that main area would become a garden, a communal garden. And, and this was executed and this is the sort of the strength of the whole scheme. Uh, it provides it with its quiet nature and um, with the reason a uh, rationale for the, uh, the residents here to uh, to come together uh, and join in in the maintenance. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, some of the houses have got uh, private rear gardens which phase on to this communal garden and provide um, yeah, uh, an interesting facade um, uh, and uh, yeah it can be walked through by the public but the public is sort of by nature by the uh, point of arrival encouraged to go through the uh, through the central areas through the yeah so uh, this gives you an idea so enough to put a chair and tables and have some planting um, the idea was to have everything gr uh, green and um, yeah uh, that of course changes with modern furniture and, um, and modern ideas but um, uh, it has survived very well uh, it has recently been renovated um, and uh, yeah some of the brickwork repaired and um, it, uh, it continues to exist uh, to a great extent well, a second scheme um, uh, is was done by a colleague of uh, Aldo van Eyck. Um, in fact, the next generation, Herman Hetzberger. Um, and um, uh, it was in this area, um, uh, which is not far from where we looked at these housing schemes just earlier on. Uh, and uh, we're just going to have a look at this area, which uh, in the 1960s was proposed for demolition, uh, in fact, was being demolished in order to make way for uh, a, a major road, uh, which uh, runs through here. Um, and we're just going to have a look at that now. But Amsterdam has got this character, the canals, the, uh, the, 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 the 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 townhouses five sometimes six stories high um uh, uh, on canals with trees you know this is traditional Amsterdam this is what it has become famous for since the 17th century um and Herman Hetzberger uh, who was asked to do some infill uh, in this um was uh, uh, an architect, Dutch trained architect, um, and uh, he had uh, made a name for himself with a scheme for Central Beheer, uh, which is an office building, and this was sort of an interlinked, interlocking office building, which encouraged sort of uh, communication between the uh, uh, the staff um and um, was, was had plants within it and was more uh 
to be like a village or a, a, a town rather than sort of a, a traditional office. And, uh, and this was a very influential scheme. Um, yeah, and so here we see that area. The area we're going to talk about is sort of this block. Yeah. And you can see some of the roofs have got a different color of, of roof, but it's, there's infill within that. So all this was in order to make way for this road. It winds its way around the edge next to the railway, which was already there. And here you see this dense area. And this traditionally, the, these were the wood, hout, tynan, wood gardens. This is where the, uh, the timber from the uh, sh ships was unloaded and sort of sawn up and uh, traded. Um, and uh, yeah, all, all this here sort of was sort of demolished. Uh, here you see the demolition taking place. And then the urban, and, and then you can leave what is there and sort of accept that you look at back of houses. But the Hermann Hetzberger decided to um, restore the urban fabric, the facade, onto the road, and particularly because it was going to be a major road to the station. Um, his uh, houses were again sort of th thought of with stairs and uh, different entries and, um, and with different layers above each other. This was so-called social housing. So here we see sort of uh, maisonettes uh, on two stories with the other, with the next one above it, with, with three, uh, on three levels. Um, and uh, yeah, that creating a narrow uh, courtyard within that, where, in which there was also an additional housing block in order to achieve the densities, which made this possible to build this as social housing. This is 1982. This is whilst Margaret Thatcher was demolishing social housing here in this country, um, it was still uh, very much an uh, experimental process. And um, yeah, this is one of these schemes that sort of uh, was cutting edge at the time. And you see sort of the facade being created along the street here with setbacks. It was the intention that there were going to be sh shops in those as well. The busy roads, of course, inhibited that. But in recent years, the traffic has been slowed down and reduced substantially. So there is um, there's a new drive to restore this. This is along the side of uh, the railway. Uh, and here's the, the last bit. Yeah, so this is the narrower bit where the houses were, had to be pushed up. Uh, in order to achieve the densities here, a block of apartments, a block of flats was put up. Uh, but it gives you an idea as to sort of what this was intended to do with the, with, with access from the from the road as well uh, to uh, um, flats at the rear, uh, some garages, which were uh, supposed to be flexible, also could be uh, could serve as shops. Um, and here you see the sort of the end with a corridor going in here and the corridor going into the area there. Uh, and new shops are being created along the main road, uh, such as this one, which uh, is very much the spirit of the old. On the inside, uh, to the city side, the uh, old street, the Harlem Strat was retained. It is a major thoroughfare for cyclists. And from that, uh, there were a number of houses that had been demolished, and uh, these were sort of infilled with additional housing with a with an archway forming an archway with a with a threshold as you come into the area, and you, you arrive into sort of the residential area, for, and here's the second entrance. They're different. Um, this one has got a, a library here along the side. Uh, stuck up, which is one of these things that you see everywhere in the Netherlands now, and also here in places. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, you, you you can walk in. As you see, it is a it's, it's pedestrian, but cars can drive in. 
uh, in emergencies um, as you see when builders are com come in um, and as uh, was it the the, 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 uh, the time at, uh, in the 1980s uh, that would include including sculptures but it one of the things was sort of uh, having sufficient uh, green space to provide you with sort of a, a quiet area rather than paving it all and uh, yeah here's the other entrance here you see the the the, uh, the libraries on the on the side and here you see the back entrance with various sort of uh, planted areas to provide privacy um, uh, to the residents and trees also in sort of strategic positions uh, which uh, create uh, a sense of place that is unequaled in other schemes also here uh, sort of seating walls which you see here and you can come here in the summer and it is thriving these photographs we're taking uh, on, at Easter um, but uh, uh, the scheme is still looks uh, pristine um, <clears throat> excuse me um, people have sort of uh, uh, sort of taken uh, or extended their thresholds by placing plants in different places and uh, yeah it is uh, uh, there is a playground uh, uh, with modern equipment now um, but you know you can also see that there are issues so and I particularly like this sort of entrance you know um, this is done at a period when sort of the uh, uh, we weren't as concerned about access as we are now and uh, accessibility and uh, the uh, the sort of the comment by the occupied occupier is bad decisions make good stories yeah so you see the the chairlift yeah um a lot of the original people still live here um and uh, there is a good community spirit they people know each other uh, and uh, yeah but in the uh, people from amsterdam are also known to speak their uh, their mind uh, yeah and uh, this is um yeah one of those things uh people have chosen to to continue to live here and to bring up children here as in this instance here so uh it, it is a scheme that couldn't be built today like this but uh, it continues and um, is uh, loved by the people who live here and uh, is very much yeah treasured by the state and and the town it is very much part of uh, something that happened in, in in the netherlands you know it is it is it sort of harks back to traditional values which we um, particularly see in the scheme at almere where a new town was created um, to uh, built on sort of models of uh, the 17th century Dutch town with different types of buildings and towers and um, you could say Lynchian uh, in, in style or Gordon uh, Cullen um, so but um, this is uh, yeah here uh, this is Almir Avon taken this year with the uh, the street just being repaved uh, or relayed rather uh, to uh, to to level it because this is all made up land in the new polder. So this has been uh, a, a trend uh, to provide people with green space over which they had control, and this wasn't just a drive in these housing schemes but has been a general trend throughout housing in uh, urban environments and to provide people with uh, the ability to uh, create or provide ownership of the city 
and and care um, one of the drives has been the notion of facade gardens and i just thought it might be worth a sort of uh, including those because they're very much part of the spirit of these housing schemes which i just showed and they're contemporary with them and it is something that um, is loved by the residents it provides them with privacy and a reason to be outside and it it encourages conversation and uh, ownership uh, which is what you want if you want to build a community in the city the housing scheme similarly did that and that i think is the main reason for uh, their success thank you very much Jan, thank you very much indeed and thank you also for cooperating with our slightly shortened timetable which is much appreciated mm. um if i may we have um i'm just about to post a question of my own actually which is um very excellent. I've probably just sent it to to Annabelle, so I'll read it in a minute. But um, um, if I may start with some questions, and I hope others will will post um, um, queries, questions, comments as well. Um, you you touched eventually on my first query, Jan, about um, modern ideas of accessibility standards. But in your first example. Um, you mentioned that it had been recently renovated, but there still seem to be a lot of steps about, including that irritating first step into the front door. Which mm -hmm. Yeah, been over all the time. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, I find it interesting that you say, say it's an irritating first step. Yeah, I mean it. It was that notion of the threshold, and um, uh, and it it is a is a way of indicating. Um, uh, ownership and 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 yeah from uh certainly perception you know you don't need any signs in this and um yeah it it, it is uh, it is a difficulty uh, for people with access problems and yeah but i'm glad it has been retained because it is so much part of that period of the spirit that it is well it's an integral feature of it um and um, and it's a pity in a way that this cannot be continued today you know i mean it can can still be continued sort of with alternative but you need a lot more space in order to provide wheelchair access which is what is required all around but creates very bland landscapes indeed it does um mm but so do ramps that are placed on those irritating first steps to get people inside their houses so mm -hmm. <laughs> you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't i think yeah yeah annabelle sent me a message saying how influential were these architects inside and outside the netherlands she says some oh. lovely warm ideas with all the planting and feeling of care yeah well um both aldo van eyck and herman hetzberger are international figures um so their books uh, um, I've, 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 I've got you two of Hermann Hetzberger. Um, he, Hermann Hetzberger has written a whole series in English. Uh, as far as I know, he's still alive. Um, he must be getting on, but um, he um, he is uh, still, you know, uh, he, um, he, he was always uh, a key figure in international architecture um, and um, has been quoted very widely and um, and these are not their best known schemes but they are schemes that landscape architects were taken to and um, that's why i showed them i wanted to revisit them and i thought this would be a good opportunity to do so so uh, um, my first visit was 40 years ago so that is uh, that shows you something or more than 40 years actually so um, when i was a student and um, and i wasn't disappointed um, i was actually quite delighted to see them and to see the standard at which they were cared for um not just by the authorities but also by the people themselves and the way they claimed ownership and they came to talk to me whilst i was taking my photographs so yeah they they are and yeah these are 
internationally renowned architects. Thank you very much. Ginny asks, do you know roughly what percentage of housing in the Netherlands is for social rent compared uh -huh. to the UK? Well, when in 19, uh, 1990, uh, uh, just about 80% of all housing was rented accommodation. And I use the word rented because they were it isn't council rented it's mostly it, it it is housing association yeah um and we don't speak of council houses we take we talk of rented accommodation so that provides you with a different sort of attitude and approach i think um and uh, but uh, then in 1990 um it's um, all started to change or so 91 it all started to change when sort of the thatcherite um, ideas were also taken on in the Netherlands and uh, yeah home ownership is uh, has gone up it's almost 50 percent now so um, um, yeah there is uh, yeah there may may even be more at this moment but it's sort of in that that region uh, still uh, an enormous amount of it is rented accommodation and um, that is you know I think in a way it's good and rents are controlled you know, Amsterdam has just issued, just in the last month or so, issued uh, sort of, they also control uh, private rental markets. So it prevents you, uh, prevents uh, poorer people being driven out of the city. Um, and um, yeah, that notion of what's a mix of people, you know, is, is it the poor and the rich or is it, you know, different communities? What are we mixing? Um, what are, what do we throw in the mix? You might say, and that, those are all sort of issues that you might sort of wish to debate. And people like Hetzberger and Aldo van Eyck were great philosophers and very well read, and they would be able to quote you left, right, and center about the things that inspired them. And uh, they, they, yeah, and that spirit sort of continues. Um, and fortunately. Uh, a lot of this, the, the sort of rented accommodation continues today. Um, a very, very different situation, isn't it, to yeah. that within the UK? Um, yeah. Ginny adds that she loves the facade gardens, by the way, which I think mm. is probably a, um, something we all would have commented on. Um, John says, comment and a question. Firstly, impressive and attractive designs and good to see that ambition, aspiration and care applied. Why do you think schemes of this quality have built in the Netherlands and very rarely in the UK? Who built the social housing scheme in um Jan? Can you read the the um the chat because I'm not even um I, I haven't got the oh it's H O U T T U I N E oh, Houtonen. Okay, Houtonen. I would never have got that. So Okay. Uh, what was the question on Houtonen? I'll, I'll read it again. Um it's um Impressive, attractive designs, and good to see that ambition, aspiration, and care applied. Why do you think schemes of this quality yeah. have been built in the Netherlands and very rarely in the UK? Who built the social housing scheme in the town okay. I'm terrified of? That, that was Hetzberger, Hermann Hetzberger. Yeah, you know, the guy which I showed you earlier on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, uh, he, he was responsible with his uh, team, and he, 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 as I say, it. It was all about participation. It was it is participation in in architecture. It is participation with the residents. So and, why don't we do that? Um, well, in, in a way, you know, the scheme at Biker that there was an attempt to involve the local community. Yeah. But yeah, uh, here it has come really from Team Ten, uh, who, and from people. Um, which was going on in the Netherlands and uh, Louis Leroy, the artist and uh, wild gardener um, who started in the 1960s building gardens um, uh, in the city together with the people and saw this as a collaborative process, people being part of nature and building it. Um, and that is what... Um, what was the intent there? Um, and this we can also see within Team 10 um, as one of the fundamental principles. Um, and why that isn't being done here is that architectural training has been sort of uh, 
well, it, 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 it's been more difficult. And, um, and, and also, the, there are, um, certainly from this period of the 1980s, uh, housing departments were sort of demolished um, and um, sort of they weren't able to initiate any new ideas anymore. Mm. Um, and this has been an important sort of period these last 40 years. And we have, yeah, as a result of the Thatcherite ideas of privatization of housing, this, uh, the right to buy, this has become a real issue. There has been very little innovation, but there's also been very little innovation in private housing because basically there's no need because there's such a big demand you can you know skip the green space and you know sell off your units and give it out and not care about the environment but here people um, and and place came together and that is the whole principle behind uh, van Eyck and Hetzberg uh, this sort of participation it is creating a place and um, and that I think has been done very successfully here in these two schemes. And I can mention a few other schemes. And there are some great schemes of the early 1990s, which I'm happy to talk about at some later date. Mm, thanks. A completely different attitude to the yeah. issue. Um, John actually puts in a rider as well. Which organization in Amsterdam was it a housing association or the municipality or? Well, the municipality controls, yeah. So uh, uh, when they give out uh, to a housing association, they 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 control what is being built, um, and um, and uh, yeah, and then it's up to a housing association to to realize that. And sometimes that that isn't quite you know but but in most cases that is a very successful sort of collaboration um i don't exactly know the arrangement that was made here uh the, the i know the council in the letter scheme was very much involved i also know in zwolle uh, i was taken there by the uh, city landscape architect uh, when well, we were taken around and we met alder van eyck then um and that is uh, that is well that that was uh, probably 1980 and um, so um, and uh, that yeah so that was done by a housing association it's but the, the drawings was all sort of submitted to the council and it was in negotiated with them and yeah uh, so it, again, it is a collaborative process who took the initial decisions. Uh, a lot of the ideas were from these two architects and, and, and then, you know, trying to get the maximum out of it. It's, it is, it's a pure drive to achieve something that is unique and fits the place and builds on it rather than sort of uses it. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um... Ginny says, um, suggests with growing awareness of climate change and the housing crisis, do you think attitudes are likely to change in the UK? Well, um, we have to. We haven't got a way out. You know, there is no option of not dealing with it. Uh, the, the problem is that the people in power don't believe that they will be re-elected once they implement what is necessary and that's why there is such delay in everything but yeah if you look at project drawdown and you look at the international issues even today what came in the emails uh, it makes desperate reading and we do need to take action we do need to do things and we are late already. Uh, I'm not saying too late, but um, we need drastic action. And there is no way of escaping some fundamental changes. Um, there are problems everywhere. 
um i know just today i was alerted in sort of that uh, uh, uh places like portugal in the second year running haven't have only had half the rainfall which they had usually it's extremely dry we're going to have more fires like we had sort of five years six years ago um their temperature changes have are dramatic already five degrees um it's going to come here at some point um but when we're going to take these decisions it is it remains with the electorate it seems you know that's what they want us to think do we want it well we we do and we don't yeah um nobody wants to give up their holidays to foreign destinations and that is the main one of the main problems and we don't want to give up our cars mm -hmm. yeah um i mean when when the uh, uh in oxford people are screaming for um because of a few close off roads well in in the netherlands these things are being implemented with yeah um, sort of um, by stealth um and you know uh the hague for example last last week introduced uh if you take your car into the town center you pay 75 euros uh, but it's 10 minutes or a day um if it's two days it's 150 euros well is it worth it probably isn't so you try and find different ways of transporting yourself and things quickly change um the whole way in which the the landscape has been altered in the netherlands is uh, is is going towards you know sort of trying to reuse the car it hasn't been extremely successful in particular with the pandemic um and it's the same here you know i've seen car use increase rather than reduce in the last few years it's a real problem uh, and that needs to be addressed we need to do it again politics politics um, I was very taken at the beginning of your talk by that um, idea of housing as the dress of life. And I think it's a very splendid, but a very revealing um, idea. Mm. So considering what we've just been discussing, what do you think this is about the modern sartorial standards of the Netherlands as compared to the UK in terms of social self-respect and cohesion? Well, um, I don't want to be disrespectful, but uh, th there seems to be a greater movement towards s sensibility towards the environment in the Netherlands. I'm saying that half-heartedly because the other thing that's happened in the last two years is the big farmers' demonstrations. The government is trying to reduce nitrogen levels, um, and they're way too high. Uh, and one of the main contributors or the main contributor is agriculture um, and they have been trying to reduce uh, and get farms to alter their practices and this has led to big demonstrations and road closures uh, demonstrations and um, yeah um, that uh, has forced the government to change tack which is pretty disastrous uh, they haven't been re-elected as such but what is there now is pretty weak um and uh, weak governments are never a good idea if you want to instigate change mm. so we'll have to see what's going to happen next mm. but you know it is difficult i mean and so it just shows that you can't make these changes without take, taking the people along and and the question is how do you do that and and there are no straight answers to this if there were it would be done everywhere and we would be much further but the one thing is certain is that there's a great need to do so and we cannot continue without doing so well thank you Jan. Um, that was a real clarion call. Um, I'm very grateful. Unless there are any further questions, I think that's a very good note of which to hand back to Annabelle, if I may. Are you there, Annabelle? Oh dear, we've locked her out. I think we might have. Yeah. <laughs> I think she's uh, there. She is. Sorry, sorry. 
<laughs> just engrossed in it all. Yeah. One of those nights. Yeah, and that was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for, um, you know, such a scene setting, which I think really helps not bury the projects, but but sort of set them up really nicely. Thank you. Thank you for that. You always do explain <laughs> things so well as well. You, they're used to it. Um, I think uh, two quick things. One is that I can remember being taken by Chris Baines around Appledorn oh. and uh, just being absolutely amazed by it all. Just and was very inspired by that. And the other thing I've forgotten. Um, oh, the other thing was the um, you used the word knitting for that um, for the for the swirly whirly one, and it is it's cable stitch, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is knitting, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. It's, it's, it's a crazy scheme. It's the fabric of life, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it, it is, it's crazy, but you know, even crazy things can be successful. That's what it shows. Well, I think I think. What's very interesting is that it looks crazy on paper, yeah. But your your aerial photos just make it look just idyllic. Yes, I yes. think that is extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is, it's remarkable, isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. it's well worth visiting. So it's uh, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, and, guided and tour I think is coming up. <laughs> oh well, <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you very, very much indeed.